Uh, I'm going to continue with our uh, lectures, uh, but this time we will switch the topic to the introduction to probabilistic graphical models. And uh, this is intended uh, for you to um, just to get all of you on the same, more or less, the same uh, page, both with biology and the tools and the maths a little bit. So I will first introduce some really, really basic notions most of you hopefully are familiar with, but uh, let's just start with the basics. So I am going to assume you all know what are random variables and that you know about distributions of random variables. Um, so we denote the random variable x, uh, its distribution with p of x. And uh, we denote the joint probability of two random variables, x and y, uh, as p of x, uh, comma y. So now uh, we can compute the probability uh, of x itself as a sum over the values of y uh, of p of x of y, of the joint probability of x and y. And the same for the probability uh, of y, and these, um, uh, the, the, these probabilities computed in this manner are called marginal probabilities. Okay? In the continuous case, if you want to compute the, the, the marginal probability, um, you, uh, so you, uh, you, you do an integration over the values of the second uh, variable. So to compute the p of x, you uh, compute an integral over the values of y of the joint probability of x and y, and the same for the probability of y. So this can be visualized nicely in such plots. So this is uh, a plot visualizing in colors uh, the, the joint probability of two variables, and we see the marginal distributions of the individual variables on the, on the uh, plotted across the axis as histograms. And for the continuous case, you see here a contour plot for the joint probability and the continuous probability distributions on the axis. Um, so another very important notion, and this formula I hope all of you have in your mind all the time, um, is a conditional probability. So the conditional probability of x given y is uh, p of x given y is equal to the ratio of the joint probability over uh, uh, the probability uh, of y. So as an example, uh, so this, is, this formula is actually pretty useful. So as an example, uh, con consider uh, uh, the variable, uh, the random variable g to indicate overexpression of a certain oncogene. Um, let uh, C denote a uh, random variable that indicates the presence of a tumor. Then the, the, the P of C and G would be the probability of oncogene overexpression and the person suffering from the tumor. And now um, P of G given C, that will be the probability of oncogene overexpression in tumor patients. And this we can actually assess by just checking the frequency of this oncogene overexpression in such people who have cancer. Uh, but then if you uh, consider the probability of C given G, that will be the probability of cancer given the overexpression um, uh, of, of, of the gene. And that might be difficult to assess. So if you want to, to compute this, this probability of C given G, so you want to get the probability of having cancer given the oncogene, then you just use this, the, the, this definition. So you have the probability of the, the, joint, the, the, the joint probability that equals to the, the conditional probability of G given C times P uh, probability of C. That equals, again, to the probability of C given G times the probability of G. So if you use this and you stuff it in here, uh, you get the Bayes uh, theorem, which is, uh, which is an extremely useful uh, theorem. 
So you, you, you can then compute this, this diagnostic uh, conditional probability of having cancer given the overexpression of the oncogene. You can compute this without determining this explicitly, without actually measuring it, just using the other probabilities that are easier to assess. So these are like really, really basic uh, uh, notions that I wanted to, uh, to remind you. And I'm going to say again really just a couple of words about uh, statistical inference, what that is. And I'm going to tell you this on, uh, on an example. So let's consider a random variable, x, which um, corresponds to an outcome of a coin tossing experiment. And then if you want to model that experiment statistically, you're interested in what, uh, what it would be the probability of the coin landing on uh, heads. So the, 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 uh, this probability will be now denote, denoted uh, theta, and uh, this will be our model parameter. So if we want now to estimate uh, theta from the data, the data for us will be n experiments of tossing a coin. So you will have x1 to xn, where each xi corresponds to one tossing uh, of a coin. And the values of these small x's will be either heads or tails. And now, this has been touched upon already by David, but you can have two different approaches to estimate this parameter. One of them is so-called the frequentist uh, approach, and the other one is called the Bayesian uh, approach. So I'm going to focus here on the frequentist approach, since we somehow assumed uh, we will move to the Bayesian stuff later on. So the frequentist approach will be to find the best guess of the theta from the data, usually invoking so-called maximum likelihood. And I'm going to, um, again, give you an example of this in a moment. And the Bayesian approach would be now to regard this parameter, theta, itself as a, param uh, as a random variable with its own distribution. And to find the, uh, the and to estimate the posterior of that distribution, uh, so the probability of theta given d. Okay. So, what would uh, frequentists uh, do to estimate uh, the theta? Uh, so, the frequentists use the likelihood function a lot. So, the likelihood. This is defined, is denoted L, uh, L of theta. So it's a, it's a function of theta. But it's the, by definition, it is the probability of the data that we see given the model. So here, given the theta. And for the coin tossing experiments, if we have observed in all our n experiments k um, heads, this likelihood for that example would be given by the binomial distribution. So we would be now having you know, n choose k, so the number of uh, possibilities in which you would have um, the coin landing on, on, on heads, k times. And now the probability, uh, the product of the probabilities of your random variable x equal to, um, to, to xi. So there's a product over i, which is the index of the experiment given theta. And now if you skip the entries k, this becomes proportional to a product over, uh, of, sorry, the product uh, of n uh, terms, which will be theta to the power of 1 if in the if experiment the coin landed heads, and 1 minus theta to the power of 1 if it landed on tails. And here this would be zeros otherwise. So this actually is, of course, uh, theta to the power of k times 1 minus theta to the power of 1 uh, to the power of n minus k. So now, okay, so, so now we computed for that example the likelihood, okay? So the, the idea of maximum likelihood is that we want to find such, an exp uh, such a value of theta which will maximize the probability of the data that we observe under that model. So what we, what we do, we actually maximize that likelihood function. But instead of maximizing directly the likelihood function, we compute the log of that, um, of that likelihood. So we maximize the log likelihood. 
which is usually denoted with small l. So you have the log uh, of l of theta, which is just, again, the log crossing example. This uh, log likelihood becomes just um, k times log of theta plus n minus k times log of 1 minus theta plus the constant, which comes from the n choose k. So it's not dependent on theta. So now, if you want to maximize that function, you just compute the derivative over theta, uh, and you set it to 0. And what you get out uh, after doing that, that small calculation uh, is that your estimate of theta is k over n. Okay. So now, I'm not going to talk about this uh, at all. But as so the, in the frequentist uh, approach, if you wanted to assess how sure you are of your estimate of the theta, you would do the bootstrap, just uh, as, as David explained. So OK. So these were really, really basic notions that we are working with every day, essentially. And now I'm going to move towards uh, uh, graphical models. So the philosophy. Um, I, I will explain the sort of philosophy behind the graphical models on a, uh, again on an example. So you can consider some um, experiment or some uh, real, like an object that you want to model. Here, these will be um, or your random variables that you want to model. So here, you, you will be looking at, uh, at biological players, which will be genes, let's say A, B, and C. And there are relationships between these, these genes or your, or your random variables. And here, uh, in this example, this will be gene regulation. Okay? So we can imagine there's a relationship that A regulates C and B regulates uh, C. So, all, so these players and their, in, and their relationships, you can describe using a graph. Okay? So you show the genes as the, the nodes in the graph. And you show the relationships as edges. And now, the, 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 what, what, you, what you can then actually uh, derive from this, this, what corresponds to that graph in a probabilistic uh, graphical model is a factorization of the uh, joint distribution over these random variables. Or in, maybe to, to put it more uh, general, I will say more mathematical details in a moment, but generally <clears throat> using the, from this graph, we can read the de statistical dependencies between the random variables. That's why these graphs are very useful as, as, as a presentation. So before I will go into mathematical details, I just want to put you, bring a very important message <laughs> to you. So there are different you know, graph representations of different relations between uh, random variables, and you have to be very careful in interpreting them. Um, and also, not all, all of them mean the same thing. So, uh, one other, uh, so there are statistical dependencies that I will talk about in a moment, but there are also correlations which you can observe among different variables. And there are what people like to think of caus causative uh, relations, okay, and they are definitely not the same. So, if you, on this example of, of uh, gene regulatory network, if you assume that the truth in a regulate, regulatory network uh, among your three genes uh, here, x, y, and z, is that the x regulates y, and then y in turn uh, regulates z, then of course all three of these variables, in particular, x in the beginning and z in the end, they are correlated, but they are not interacting directly. Okay? And then if you were to consider a correlation, or here in, if we look at expression measurements, if you look at the core expression network among these three genes, all three of them would have been connected. Okay? This would be a clique over three nodes. Um, so if the edge now corresponds to correlation, all three nodes are, are connected. But the actual regulatory network behind such a correlation network uh, could be one of many possible. So it could be that this is the one that is the true one that we, that we assumed, that x regulates y and y regulates z. 
But then also, all three of them would have been correlated if x would be regulating y and regulating y and x would be regulating z. And also, even more <laughs> surprisingly, if you can think of, um, another scenario would be that all three of them are actually not at all causative to one another. They are not the, uh, interacting with one another. But there's a third, uh, fourth uh, variable that we don't measure, we don't observe. And this one is regulating all three of them. And then the, again, they would have been uh, correlated. So correlation does not mean causation. You have to be uh, very clear about this. So OK, so coming back to, to graphical models, uh, there is one, uh, one specific um, type of graphical models I want to talk about here. And these are so-called Bayesian networks. So Bayesian networks. Um, shortly BNs. They are defined for uh, a set of random variables. So you can consider L, large, uh, capital, capital L random variables, uh, for x1 to xL. So this is defined for, 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 for this set. And it consists of a directed acyclic graph that is defined on, um, uh, on a set of vertices v, which corresponds to indices of your random variables. And it has a set of edges e. And so-called local probability distributions, which are defined for each vertex. Okay. Um, and now the Bayesian network is defined as a family of probability distributions for which the joint probability will factorize in a very specific manner. So this, uh, so the manner that it is factorizes is given here. So the joint probability over these random variables is supposed to factorize in a way that you have a product over each vertex. And uh, uh, the terms in this product are the probability of the vertex given a set, a specific set of other uh, subset of other variables which are the so-called parents of that ve vertex in the Bayesian network, in the graph. Okay? So here we denoted this as x with the subindex pa of n, which just means that the pa of n denotes the set of parents of the vertex in the graph. So the, 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 this, this x of p of n is a set of other vertices or other random variables, um, sorry, other ra random variables, such that 1 to k are the parents of n in G. So this might sound very complicated, but it's actually very easy, and maybe an example will be helpful. So this, in this example, this is the graph in the Bayesian network. So, you, so A, B, C, D, E are the vertices, and they correspond to random variables now. And uh, if this is now a Bayesian network, there is a uh, the, the joint distribution over these random variables will factorize in such a manner that this joint uh, probability is equal to p of a, which is on the top. It does not have any any parents times uh, the probability of b given its parent a times the probability of C given its parent A, times D given the, um, sorry, times the probability of D given its parents B and C, times the probability of E given its parents D. Okay, so the, the number of terms is equal to the number of vertices, and it's always the conditional probability over the parents in the graph. So, of course, not all joint, uh, joint probability distributions satisfy such factorization. So the Bayesian network is constructed to, to, to only for such joint probabilities which exactly satisfy this factorization. Okay? So in fact, what this Bayesian networks represent are statistical interdependencies between variables. Okay? So what I want to say is that there are different tools that can be used, many more than I will discuss here, that represent different relationships, and you have to be aware of what they represent. So for the graphical models, which are Bayesian networks, 
the, the, the most basic interrelations that you can read are the co so-called conditional independencies among random variables. So what are the conditional independencies? So if we consider two variables, A and B, uh, then they will be conditionally independent given a, a third random variable, C, uh, and we will write this as A independent of B given C. If the joint probability of A and B given C will factorize into the probability of A given C times the probability of B given C. Okay? Um, so in this definition, A, B, and C can be also subsets of random variables, not individual random variables. And if the C, the set uh, of variables C is empty, uh, then we can say that A and B are actually marginally independent, so that and we write it just A independent of B. So what you can see here is you, you, so you, so these graph uh, so in the Bayesian network the relationships of variables that are represented in the graph they also help us to decode the, to decode the conditional independencies among variables. So in this graph, if you look at this very simple Bayesian network, the joint probability over A, B, and C, this factorizes into, well, the probability of A given its parent C, the probability of B given its parent C, and the probability of C itself. So now, if you want to check what, uh, the conditional independence of A and B given C, what you can write, of course, is uh, from, the, uh, from the definition that this is the joint probability of A, B, and C divided by the probability of C. But now, from the graph, from the factorization that we have wrote, written here, we know that this joint probability is equal to here, to this, sorry. We, um, the, 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 the P of C, um, is, is, uh, is uh, how do you say that? It's like reduced, cancels out. Yeah, it's cancelled out. So what we get in the end is uh, P of A given C times P of B given C. So this, per definition, is conditional independence of A and, uh, and, and B given C. So in general, A does not have to be independent of, of B on their own, but given the third variable, and the fact that their joint distribution is described by this Bayesian network, they are. Given, they are in the condition of independent given C. So I'm not going to get into details and explanations of how this can be decoded here, but uh, there are more uh, of these relationships. So in particular, in this example, where C is a parent of both A and B, we can, we, we can show that A is independent of B given C. So once we observe C, they, be, they, are, uh, condition, they, they are conditionally independent. But in general, the, the, the two of them are not independent of, of each other. The same if, if A is a parent of C and C is a parent of B, a and B are conditionally independent given C, but uh, marginally, that, I mean, that on their own, they are not independent. However, in this, I don't really see, sorry, they should be somehow gray, meaning that you observe C, but it doesn't, okay, it's written here. So there is a phenomenon which we call explaining away. So if A is a parent of C and B is a parent of C, then they are actually not. So you can show this, they're not conditionally independent given C, but they are independent of, uh, of each other. So just to summarize this uh, very quickly, uh, to, um, to actually learn this, this Bayesian network model from the data, uh, you need to, you know, to specify its own parameters. You need to specify the graph uh, structure. So there's a lot to learn. 
So if you want to learn a Bayesian network, which has the, the graph G and the set of parameters which describe the local probability distributions, which I didn't talk much about. Um, so if you want to learn this from data, which we denote D, this is, will involve two steps. So you need to find the so-called maximum a posteriori, the map estimate of the network structure. So this will be, we will denote this as a G star. So this will be the uh, such graph for which the probability of the graph given the data is maximal. And now given the optimal network structure, G star, we want to find the map uh, estimate of the parameters theta. So the uh, such theta star, which maximizes the probability of, uh, of, the, uh, of the parameters given this optimal graph structure in the data. So, uh, so applying the bias theorem that I mentioned to you, we can find that, that, that the posterior is proportional to the posterior of the graph structure given the data is proportional to the probability of the data given the graph times the probability, of the data. So we call this a prior probability of the graph. This can be uniform over the graphs or can have some you know, higher probabilities for more probable graphs, lower probabilities for less probable graphs, and so on. Um, where the, pro so, so in this, uh, so this is a prior, but to, com to compute this, you need to do uh, a large, uh, marginalization. So to compute the probability of the data given the graph, um, so the likelihood of the graph, you need to compute an integral over the, the parameter values for the probability of the data given the graph and the parameters times the probability of the parameters given the graph. So there is uh, this invokes a pretty in in intensive uh, marginal likelihood computations. So I'm going to continue with uh, more very specific examples of graphical models, which will be hidden Markov models and Markov chains uh, on Thursday. So today I'm just going to finish this very long day <laughs> by a short summary that uh, we talked about the probabilistic graphical models. And then they, in general, you can say that they describe the factorization of joint probability over a set of variables and that it describes conditional independence relations among variables. So in th this is one of m many models that describe some statistical relationships between variables, and it, they, 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 they actually prove to be very useful in different applications in computational biology, in particular modeling regulatory networks, but many other types of interactions including such models where you look for causal relationships between your variables. Um, yeah, and that's it, actually. OK. <laughs> so, ah, no, wait. I have to say something very important. So these are references for if you want to read more. But also, I have to acknowledge Nico Berenwinkel, who unfortunately is not here. But I was lucky to use his, uh, a lot of his slides okay, for that talk. And I'm going to use them. Uh, I use more on Thursday as well. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>